Welcome to the Tactical Historian. I'm Paul, the self-proclaimed Tactical Historian, and I'm with John Van Zyl of the Rhodesian Light Infantry, and we will be discussing his experience in the Bush War. Many of you already know him from his YouTube series, but thank you for coming on the show. I know it's late, so I really appreciate you coming on. Uh, it's a pleasure, Paul. Thanks for having me. Well, I think we can just kick this off with, can you talk about growing up in Rhodesia? Some of the stories I've heard, it's kind of like the Wild West a little bit. <laughs> um, you know, there was a, uh, a kind of a, a frontier feeling to the country. Uh, it was a relatively young country, um, sort of from... 1880 so being born there in 1956 the country had only really made a transition from the stone age and darkest africa sort of um you know 70 years 70 80 years prior to me being born um and so yeah it 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 it, it, it i feel quite privileged to have grown up in in africa at that time because uh, it was wild and rugged and um, and beautiful, um, with lots of wild animals and 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 huge rivers and and rugged mountains and uh, lush jungles and thick forests and yeah, um, a beautiful climate, a rich soil, um, and uh, my I had I had a lovely childhood i had i had warm loving family and my parents were very supportive um and my dad taught me i would say bushcraft my dad was a real uh, for want of a better word a woodsman <laughs> and um and so you know hunting shooting and fishing were were part of my sort of childhood experience and even if you grew up in a town um you know i grew up in a town and I can still remember when I was a teenager and going to parties and everything, coming home at midnight um, with the lights switched off, getting changed into my pajamas, looking out the window and seeing a, a leopard uh, staring at me, you know, sitting on the front lawn looking at me. Um, so the, the wilds of Africa were never far away. Um, and growing up in Rhodesia was um yeah it was exciting for a youngster you know we there was no internet we never we never had television <laughs> and uh, so you had to you had to kind of make your own um amusement and usually that involved um uh, you know things like hunting and fishing um and horse riding and camping and yeah that type of thing yeah. fantastic and as far as uh, education um what sort of schools were there private schools that you attended or or public schools we were based on the british uh on the british schooling system um so you know our qualifications came from the uk um my dad started off as a tobacco farmer and later became a, an anglican priest um so the anglican church had a had a couple of of, of upmarket private schools um so i started off going to to a multiracial um, private school called Peter House, um, uh, and there are, there are a few Anglican sort of church schools. Uh, in fact, my junior school was a was a Catholic, a private Catholic school where we had um, uh, Carmelite monks that taught us. Um, and then when I went to high school, it was an Anglican uh, sort of church school so we used to have to go to church every day chapel as they called it and um, and then later i went to a government school uh, so generally speaking all of the schools i went to were boarding schools so i got used to the discipline of boarding school life and in those days uh, in british boarding schools were run very strictly um, so you know corporal punishment and all that type of thing if you got caught smoking you got you know, caned you know six of the best and 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 uh, so it was nothing like i think school is today um it was very regimented there were uniforms you had to have short hair and um it was it was probably a little bit like a like a military academy you know in a way 
because it really, I think, prepared me for life in the army. Uh, so, you know, for for a lot of guys who've grown up as civilians, when they go to the army, it's a huge big culture shock to have, you know, sleep in dormitories and, and public uh, showers and and all the discipline and the, and that type of thing. But I, having gone to boarding school, I was used to all that. So it was no, I really enjoyed the army. So it was no big culture shock for me to make the transition from school to the military. Um, and yeah, um, it, we, we had three terms every year, three terms of about three month, three months each. And then in between we'd have like a month holiday. Um, and so three months of the year would be holiday and then I'd get to go home and, and have adventures. And every, every school holiday was a life changing adventure time. Um, and then, you know, off to school. Um, so the education system was fantastic. I mean, I did, um, languages. I did English, French, and Latin, and we, we had a fantastic art school and we, you know, I, I just felt the the facilities looking at it now, we had excellent facilities. We had excellent teachers who were highly trained. And in fact, Zimbabwe, which is what Rhodesia is called today. Remember, Rhodesia was a little landlocked country in the in the middle of Africa, just north of South Africa. Um, uh, has the highest literacy rate in Africa. Um, so, yeah, I know you don't want to talk too much about politics. So I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole. <laughs> <laughs> no, no worries. Um, I mean, first, before we get into that, I want to just to ask. How did you go from, uh, you know, your education growing up and then that introduction into the military? How were you introduced to the military and, and get involved with that? 1965, um, our, uh, we, we had an agreement with the UK whereby the UK was, we, prior to that, we were a British colony and had been a successfully a self-managed British colony uh, since 1923. And we supported England in World War One and World War Two, and our government had an agreement. There was a federation of states um, called the Federation of Rhodesia and Nyasaland, and split into Northern Rhodesia, which is now Zambia, and Southern Rhodesia, which is now Zimbabwe. Um, and the British government agreed to the breakup of the federation at which time Southern Rhodesia would be given their, and Zambia and Tanzania, it would be given their independence. Um, as it turned out, politicians being what they are, uh, England reneged on that agreement. Uh, even though it was written and signed and everything, they, they betrayed the agreement. And therefore, our politicians decided to unilaterally declare independence. I think it's very similar. Are you in the United States? Yes. Yes, I am. Okay. Yeah. okay. I think the United States is one of the only other countries to unilaterally, unilaterally declare independence from England. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. You know, you have your independence day. Uh, our independence day was on the 11th of November at 11 o'clock <laughs> on the 11th day of the 11th month. Um, and, uh, so we also, just like, just like you guys did, we, we declared UDI. We, it's like a divorce where, where one party says, no, we don't agree to the divorce, but the other party says, well, I'm sorry, I'm out of here. And so that's kind of what happened. We got divorced. Uh, unfortunately, the rest of the world did not recognize our declaration of independence and the country was plunged into effectively a civil war, uh, because remember that this is the height of the cold war. So uh there were um chinese backed freedom fighters insurgents guerrillas whatever you want to call them uh to our to our uh east and coming out of mozambique and there were russian backed um uh guerrillas to our north coming out of zambia um and um and we found ourselves at war uh, at this stage, in the early days of the war, I was I was about 12 years old. And then as I became a teenager, the war hotted up. And by the time I was 17 uh, and finished with school, um, 
I received my call up papers. We ha we had a um, yeah we had call up. So every eligible male in the country used to get called up into the army, um, and so I got called up. And I tried to get out of it by um, going to college, uh, but they said, look, you're young enough to do your military training, which at that time was a compulsory one year call up, uh, 365 days, and uh, and then you can carry on with your education after that. So, uh, yeah, so I got called up uh, as a national serviceman. Um, and then while I was at Llewellyn Barracks, which is where all the national servicemen went, um, we got in the first few days, we got visited by by the regular army. So there were two types of army. There was a territorial army, uh, which is like a, a, a national serviceman. And then there were, there were regular soldiers who were guys who were professional career soldiers. And there were, there were a, a couple of units uh, like the Special Air Service Regiment and the Rhodesian Light Infantry that were consisted of regular soldiers. Um, and there came a policy change whereby they decided to invite national servicemen to join these regular units. And, um, and so these guys came to Llewellyn Barracks and did like a, a PR um, recruiting exercise where they showed us videos and gave us talks. And I was very impressed. And I decided, you know, if I am going to go to war, I don't want to just be cannon fodder. I'd rather join the special forces and have them spend a whole bunch of money on me <laughs> and on my training. And in that way, in that way, I'll be, be more valuable to them, you know? <laughs> so, um, and, uh, and yeah, as it turned out, I think that is correct. Uh, we were, I signed up to join the special air service regiment, the SAS, uh, um, and, um, which is kind of, I suppose in the U S equivalent to your top tier units, like the Navy SEALs, the Green Berets. Yeah, I would say we were a command. Uh, anyway, before I could join the SAS, I first had to do, I had to first go to RLI and do a four and a half month or 18 week RLI uh, recruit course and be badged RLI. And then I could attempt to join the SAS by going through their rigorous uh, selection process, which I passed and I joined the SAS. And, um, and then later, um, for reasons which I'll explain, I left the SAS and went back to RLI because RLI had started doing fire force operations and they, the guys in the RLI were seeing a hang of a lot of action and I was anxious to get stuck in and I was tired of all the training, 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 training. I actually wanted to experience the war. Um, so it was really a huge 3D Technicolor adventure, you know, I must say. And I absolutely loved it. It was exciting. It was an absolute thrill flying around in helicopters. And, you know, I just, I just loved the army. I took to it like a duck to water. And, um, yeah, and so I ended up in three commander of the Rhodesian Light Infantry. Uh, some of my listeners might not necessarily know exactly about the RLI or the SAS. Um, could you explain to them exactly like the differences between them and, and specifically what were their roles and uh, how they were different? Okay, um, the Special Air Service Regiment, um, essentially, the essential difference between us is that they, their uh, mandate was to operate outside of the country, behind enemy lines. And so they were a, primarily a parachute regiment and, and special forces similar to the Navy SEALs, Sea, Air and Land Specialists. I would say would be a good way of describing the SAS um, and they exist to this day in the British Army based at Hereford um, and are pretty much the top tier most elite military unit you could argue in the world um, and used for you know uh, the real tip of the spear used for precision military uh, uh, missions. Um, the the idea of light infantry goes back to Europe in the 1700s is is that they used to employ 
um, hunters and gamekeepers um, as light infantrymen. And their job was to, to go ahead of the army and harass the enemy, <coughs> ambush the enemy, and try and prevent the enemy from forming up for battle. Um, they wore green, uh, green jackets, um, and their emblem was a bugle or a powder horn. Um, and, and they were light infantry, but they moved very quickly and they acted independently on the battlefield. And this idea of light infantry being a very highly mobile, uh, self-contained, um, a highly trained special forces unit, uh, in the British army became a commando unit. Uh, and hence we had the coveted green beret of the commandos. Um, and so we trained in all kinds of deployment. We trained in canoes, we trained in, in different types of boats, in helicopters, uh, parachuting out of airplanes and, um, you know, things like rope work, um, and different types types of weapons and demolitions and signals and medics. Um, so, so each unit was almost like self-contained. We, we took care of our own uh, signals. We took care of our own medical stuff. We took care of our own demolitions and we didn't necessarily have engineers to come and do the demolitions or, and so on. Um, and so the main difference between the RLI and the SAS is the RLI acted internally within the country and the SAS acted externally outside of the country. Uh, but there was quite a lot of similarity between the two units. SAS was smaller and arguably more elite. Um, <clears throat> but we, we're talking about small units. I mean, when I was in the SAS, the whole unit was 60 guys, including cooks. And, you know, so, uh, and the RLI, the whole unit was about 300 guys, including cooks and everything. So um, we're, not, we're not talking about huge, huge um, military units. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about uh, sort of your colleagues, your brothers in arms, what were the sort of people that ended up in these units? Look, the, the one interesting thing about the RLI and the SAS is they were, they were all white units. Uh, they were not multiracial. Okay. I wondered about why that was. And apparently it came from the time of the British Raj in India, when there was a revolt. I don't know if you remember when the Indian uh, army rose up against their officers, uh, their British officers, and slaughtered them. And there was a military uh, revolt against the British Raj. Um, and in order to prevent something similar happening, they raised a couple of units out of, out of just colonial, you know, uh, forces that that would undeniably be loyal in the, in, in, the, in the event of a civil war kind of situation. And so th that's why I believe Although the vast majority of the Rhodesian army was racially integrated at every level, um, there were these two kind of elite white units that, <laughs> that were small, but, but they were all white type of units. <clears throat> what kind of people were attracted to it? I, I don't think, I don't think it's, I don't think I can say any particular type of person. There was, um, generally speaking, they were mostly Rhodesians, uh, born and bred. Um, in other words, they weren't like the French Foreign Legion that consisted mostly of, 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 of foreigners, um, but from a cross-section of, of um, the guys who had university degrees generally became officers, and the guys who had a lower level of education generally became the other ranks, um, uh, but there wasn't a typical type of person who who, uh, who joined. What sort of uh, equipment were you issued as far as firearms? And this has sort of become a, a legend in sort of, I guess you could say the tactical community, historical community, but seeing you guys running around in shorts in the bush, where did that tradition come from? I, you know, that's just crazy, I think. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Bearing in mind that we were fighting in our own backyards, most of us had grown up in the bush in which we were fighting. So it wasn't like you grew up in the Bronx or you grew up in Manhattan and then you get sent to the jungles of Vietnam kind of thing, you know, where it's completely different 
and it's a different culture and everything like that. You know, it would be, it would be like you maybe grew up in New York and you get sent to Vermont, you know, to fight. So, you know, it's, it was a, a lot, it, it wasn't as if we were in a strange land with strange culture and a different climate and we, we'd grown up in the bush and it, in which we were fighting. So we were very, very comfortable to wear comfortable clothing. Um, and that generally consisted of a t-shirt, shorts, and and sort of what we call feltskuns, which are, are soft leather shoes with a with a with a soft sort of um, tread with and and very comfortable and without socks. And so Generally, the way I dressed when I was in combat was was uh, shorts with no underwear, so going commander, so to speak, uh, a t-shirt, and I found I, I used to I used to rip off the collar of the t-shirt and rip off the sleeves, because the collar would attract dirt over a long period of time, and uh, and and my feltskins with no socks, and you get used to walking through the bush in a way that you don't get scratched to pieces, um, you know. The, the Rhodesian bush is actually can be quite it's not it's not harsh neither is it I mean to I think to somebody from the United States it would be very harsh I know I went to Canada and I went to some of their wilderness areas and I couldn't believe how gentle and benign the wilderness was I mean you're not you don't have like a zillion different types of insects trying to eat you and poisonous snakes and predatory animals, you know, walking around you at night. You've got bears, you know, which are kind of scary, I suppose, but not so scary for someone from Africa. Um, and, um, but yeah, we, we had to, we got used to living with the insects and everything. And, um, and um, what we were issued with, um, in the RLI was mainly um, 7.62 by 51 um, FAL, FN FAL um, with a 20 round magazine. Um, so we we worked in sticks or, or, prols or groups of four men because that's how many men passengers could go up in a little Alouette helicopter. Um, the one guy would be a stick leader and he would carry a little A63 radio um, and he would be a rifleman and then the, uh, three of them were riflemen and one of them was an MAG gunner. So he would have a, again, the same uh, bullets, um, which were a lot more powerful than the AK uh, bullet. So if you were hiding behind a tree or a wall, uh, you'd be safe from AK bullets, but you wouldn't be safe from a, from a FN. FL, um, it would go right through the tree <laughs> and right through the wall, you know. So uh, we liked to, we liked that superior firepower. Um, we had a very small pocket air force with old, outdated um, fighter jets like Hawker Hunters um, and old Dakota transport planes. Um, you know the DC four and DC five transport planes. We had old Lancaster bombers <laughs> um, and um, and Al French Alouette helicopters, which are much smaller than the like the, the Hueys that you guys had in Vietnam, um, and and could only take a, a pilot, a tech, and four passengers. Um, but we had tactical superiority on the battlefield because our enemy never had air support, and they didn't use radios. So the fact that we had radio communications and we had air support, even if it was small and minimal, um, so we didn't have like Cobra uh, helicopters or 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 or, or A10, you know, gunships and that type of thing. We do, you know, it was, but it was enough for us to have tactical superiority. Well, infantrymen, we carried um, fragmentation grenades, um, NATO type of. Um, M962 fragmentation grenades. Uh, we in those days it was, it was kosher or legal to carry a white phosphorus, which I believe is no longer allowed. Um, so we carried M970 white phosphorus, which is great for clearing caves, 
and and uh, built up areas. So if a guy is hiding behind a wall, you can throw the grenade in front of the wall, and the white phosphorus will go up in the air and land behind the wall. You know, whereas fragmentation, you're going to be safe hiding behind the wall. Um, so we carried we we sometimes carried um, 32 Zulu and 28 R uh, anti tank um, rifle grenades, which were fired with a ballistite cartridge, uh, like a blank. Um, but mostly in the RLI, we didn't really carry that stuff. It was too heavy and wasn't really that useful. Um, and a lot of the guys carried sidearms as well. Plus, whenever we went out, whenever we got called out, we carried uh, 10 days rations, which sounds like a lot, but used to fit into a small little pack. Um, and um, the pack we called a 44 pack. I think it was used in 19, in World War II as a, almost like a radio pack. So it was, it was quite a small little pack, but when you got skilled, you knew exactly what to put in that pack. And in, and in the pack, we, we carried enough food for 10 days. I used to carry um, four water bottles um, and they were old World War II aluminum water bottles, which I found superior to the, the green plastic water bottles. The aluminum used to keep the water cold and it was in a canvas pouch. And if you wet the canvas pouch, it used to stay cold, you know, for most of the day. Um, and um, and then we each carried a bag of Ringer's lactate uh, drip, a saline drip set. Um, and we each carried 10 mils of morphine around our dog tags um, in a little tube with a needle so we could inject ourselves if we got wounded. And and then the, the saline drip was for to prevent the guy from going to shock. Um, and otherwise, our medical kit was pretty primitive, uh, just field dressings and gauze bandages and that type of thing. We didn't have a lot of the modern mod cons that you guys have got for congealing blood and that type of thing. So we had pretty good medical training, how to deal with sucking chest wounds and how to intubate, um, how to do tracheotomies um, and um, intravenous drips and all of that we didn't need a medic to do that stuff we didn't have medics really we had a troop medic uh so what every four sticks would have a troop medic and he'd have a he'd have a bag and in that bag he'd have things like amphetamines and you know all types of different uh, local anesthetic and you know sutures and so for stitching people up and that sort of thing um but if somebody did get wounded the emphasis was on on um immediate medical care and then getting him at Kazovac as quickly as possible, getting him out of the area and off to a mobile surgical unit uh, and then off to a hospital. So that was really speed of Kazovac that was most important. Like I was going to just ask you because you mentioned communications and how that really gave you uh, the step up on uh, the insurgents. I've always said this in my experience. I don't think I've ever done any sort of uh, military exercise yeah, where yeah. at the end of it, we didn't say, you know, we could have had better communication. I think communication is like such a key thing. Um, but out of curiosity, when you were dealing with the insurgents, I've heard a lot of stuff that they were being trained by Soviet and communist governments. Did you ever notice like, oh, wait. They're, they're getting better because they were trained and you noticed that? Or did you not notice that at all and the training was garbage? Okay, we were fighting two different armies. And the one was Chinese and the one was Russian. Mm -hmm. And the Russian soldiers, and a lot of them were, a lot of their officers particularly and their training staff actually went to Russia and were trained in Russia. And a lot of them even spoke Russian, you know. And they were, and they were Russian military advisors there with them. On the ground, we found the Russian trained soldiers who were Zipra, the Zimbabwean People's Revolutionary Army, um, based in Zambia, were trained, were very well trained and well disciplined and did not shy away from contact with our military forces. And when we did contact them, they held their ground and fought hard and often dying dying at their guns you know they they didn't run and bolt and um they were more conventional warfare army and they built up a huge arsenal of of russian tanks and tr and troop carriers um um armored cars um 
they had an array of anti-aircraft um, guns, 12.7s, um, you know, uh, SAM surface-to-air missiles, RPG-7s, that, that type of thing. Um, so often when we fought against them, our guys would come under, we used to get a lot of flack and, uh, and uh, our little aircraft, you know, were, were not built to withstand uh, some of the barrages that they received. They did very well. Going up against the Chinese troops, completely different. Uh, their level of training was minimal. They seemed more concerned with politicizing the, um, the local populace. Um, and so they had like political commissars who, who were civilians, but who seemed to carry more rank than the, than the military guys, you know, and they had their little red books, the thoughts of Mao Zedong and, um, and they would go in and, and they were often commit terrible atrocities against the local population in order to intimidate them and terrorize them into cooperating. Uh, they would, they would integrate themselves into the local population. So it was a bit like the, let's say the Viet, the Viet Cong, where you don't, you don't know who's a civilian and who's a combatant, you know, whereas with the Russian trained troops, they always wore proper uniforms and that type of thing. Whereas the Chinese trained troops, Mao Zedong's philosophy of them swimming like fishes in the sea, uh, you know, you never know, is the guy a terrorist or is he, or is he just a farmer? You know, you don't know until, until, you know, night comes and he, he puts on his, or well, goes and fetches his AK-47 and, you know, and becomes a, you know, becomes a, a gorilla. So that was the difficulty of the Zanla, Zimbabwean African Nationalist Liberation Army, was finding them because they dressed in civilian clothes, they acted like civilians, and you didn't know who the enemy was. And that's a psychologically difficult war for a soldier to fight when you don't know who the enemy is. Um, and you've been brought up by a kind, loving family and you, you know, you'd rather err on the side of caution than, <laughs> so it makes it difficult to, you know, you just don't want to go in and slaughter a whole village of innocent people because who's innocent and who's a combatant, you don't know. So that was the difficulty we found with uh, fighting the Chinese ones. And when we did um, engage them in combat, we found their um, levels of marksmanship and everything were terrible. So they always, they, they used to close their eyes and pull the trigger and they always fired high up. <clears throat> they, they had this mistaken belief that the, the higher you put your sights, the further the bullet would go and therefore the stronger the bullet would be. And so fortunately, we, I survived, I don't know how many, how many contacts I survived because the bullets all went over my head, you know, and um, I got showered with leaves and twigs and bark and everything, but, but lying on the ground, we, whereas we always fired low. And, even if we hit them with a ricochet, you know, if, I, if you were hiding behind a bush, I'd probably shoot at the base of the bush or even in front of the bush. And, you know, I'd probably get you. Um, whereas if I was hiding behind a bush, you'd be shooting over the bush, you know? So <coughs> I'm very grateful for that because that's probably why we, we had such a good um, kill ratio. And, 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 and I believe the RLI, uh, we lost, we, we lost 75 men and I think eight officers or something in combat. Uh, all together with people who were killed in helicopter crashes. I, mean, I think we lost about 134 guys. And I think uh, they lost about 15 or 16,000. So that was the the kind of ratio, you know, um, of... Uh, and uh, so, yeah, so... The two different armies had two very different philosophies. And uh, I must say, we, hmm, I don't know who we preferred to fight because there was something satisfying about fighting Zipra because they acted like proper soldiers. Whereas fighting Zanla, it was difficult because you, you couldn't find them. And uh, you asked me a question. Uh, one of the questions you asked me was different tactics like patrolling. I think you mentioned the word patrolling. <coughs> if I may say, um, we found patrolling particularly unproductive exercise. Um, and mainly the reason for that is mainly because the, the uh, guerrillas used youngsters uh, who were herding cattle or goats as their, as their um, tripwire, as their, um, you know, as, 
as their spies, if you like. So I suppose it would be like in Afghanistan, if you're walking through a forest patrolling or down a river and a, and a young 12 year old boy sees you and he's got a bunch of goats, you know that that information is going to get back to the Taliban in like double quick time. <laughs> They're going to, the Taliban are going to be aware that the, the guys are patrolling in that valley. You know what I'm saying? It's exactly the same in Rhodesia. These, these little guys were called um, uh, Mujibas. Um, I think in, 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 in Ireland, they called them Dickers, you know, but they basically, you know, they're basically the eyes and ears of the enemy. And uh, so these little Mujibas, you don't want to shoot the guy because he's only eight years old. But meanwhile, he, he's going to, as soon as he sees you, he's going to run off and go tell the local guerrillas, okay, there's some army guys, they're walking down that road into, in this direction kind of thing. And so that's why patrolling just was unproductive um, and, and futile. What we found was much more, more productive was clandestine OPs, where, where you'd have guys hiding on top of mountains or high features, uh, trying to hide uh, in the thick, in, amongst the rocks and the bushes with binoculars and a radio. And they would observe all the paths and all of the routes in the area. And if they then spied any enemy movement, they could then, or if they spied a woman carrying a whole lot of food into a ravine and then coming out of the ravine without any food, and then, you know, that, and that would happen two or three times a day. Then you know that there's people in that ravine, you know. And, uh, and then at night time, moving off your OP, because the, the, the guerrillas very quickly got educated that it, it doesn't pay to move in daylight because you get spotted. <clears throat> so they started moving at night. So at night we would move down off the OP and ambush the main... Um, uh, paths and routes um, and, and set up an ambush. And so there was a curfew, uh, which was from sunset to sunrise. In theory, anybody caught walking around in the open uh, at, at midnight would be regarded as an enemy. Um, and so although the RLI themselves and the SAS were not really involved in much of that type of work, Usually it was the national servicemen and the lower trained type of soldiers who would be involved in OPs and, and ambushes. Um, and, and then we would be the quick reaction force that would just wait for that call out. So a guy on top of a hill says, okay, just spotted 12 guys with AKs and RPDs uh, walking out of this village at this map reference. Immediately, um, you know, 20 kilometers away, the siren would go and a small fire force operation would lift lift off. We, we would hear the siren, we would run, jump in the choppers, and then the choppers would deploy. When we got into the choppers, we didn't know where we were going or what was happening. <clears throat> Our officers would have run to the optimum and they would have been immediately issued with the maps of that area and, and the map reference. And um, together with the chopper pilot, they would map read their way in to, to the reference. Uh, they would fly a treetop height to try and minimize the sound so that the enemy guerrillas would, did not receive early warning um, and um, and not bombshell and disappear. And so we try to catch them unawares. Um, and we normally, our tactics were normally to, to first drop far away from or reasonably far away from but unlikely escape routes from the actual sighting area, uh, we would drop stop groups. So if we saw there's a likely riverbed, which, which is probably going to be an escape route and a road, we would drop a stick of four guys on that riverbed with a machine gun and on the road, we'd drop another stick of four guys. And so we'd try and envelop the area in a, <clears throat> with stop groups, what we call stop groups. <clears throat> and then an assault group uh, would come and they would drop them right on top of the of the uh, of the enemy, and you would start a firefight, and they would generally they would run as fast as they could, bombshell in different directions. They probably had a crash of the uh, previously arranged where they could meet up, 
but they would run then into the stop groups and get mowed down. Um, so I find the guys who manned the stop groups often often saw the most action, um, and it was a turkey shoot really for them. So it became quite efficient, um, and then you, you know you'd find the whole punch up would probably last an hour or two, and then you'd put the bodies into bags, body bags, and they would be transported to the local police station with the weapons so that the bodies could be fingerprinted and the serial numbers of the weapons could be ID'd by special branch and they could build up a picture of, you know, okay, this weapon was involved in a uh, ballistically, we can match this to that farmer who was murdered and so on and so on. I could study, <coughs> build up a picture of uh, intelligence in the area and uh, any wounded um, enemy were well treated and were often only too willing to answer questions and cooperate and, and even switch sides. Uh, and hence the, hence the start of the Salu Scouts, which became a unit consisting almost entirely of former combatants who had now decided to switch sides and, uh, and, and adopt a pseudo role. Uh, and that became our most uh, successful intelligence gathering thing was just by dressing up like them and pretending to be uh, freedom fighters and meeting up with other groups of freedom fighters. And when we did, they, you know, kill them. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, so patrolling wasn't a big thing. Uh, didn't really help us very much at all. Uh, whereas most infantry soldiers think patrol, 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 patrol. But we, we found it much more efficient just to have OPs and then a quick reaction, a highly mobile force uh, to to almost as a weapon to just hit the enemy when you see them. And then when you've dealt with them, go back and wait for the next call out, you know. Well, I think that That's really does, that goes back to what you're talking about, those, uh, you know, being precision sort of missions, being able to use your intelligence and really take advantage of that. And this is really interesting to me because, like you said, I mean, I, I come from a traditional infantry background. You know, we always talk about patrolling. So this is really interesting to me because you don't hear about this side of it. Yeah. Could, could you actually talk about what you think maybe current and future military leaders can take from the example of the Bush War and what we can learn from that? Uh, maybe not so much on the tactical level as you uh, described, but maybe on the strategic or operational levels. Uh, I would say Africa was doing pretty okay in a traditional sense before the white man arrived. They <clears throat> they had a system of of elders in the tribe, and usually elders are wiser than the youngsters, so they kind of act as leaders for the tribe. And then amongst the elders, they pick someone who they respect. And he becomes like the village headman. And then the village headman gather together and they pick someone they respect and he becomes the chief, you know. And the chief is the one who presides over disputes and makes a judgment, you know, you killed this guy's wife or whatever, or you stole this guy's cow or whatever, whatever. <clears throat> and when we arrived, we saw um, no need to change that system. And so we operated with... Uh, we call them internal affairs district commissioners and a district commissioner would be like a, a magistrate and he would go into the village with the chief and they would have a court case but he would consult with the chief next to him and usually the ruling would be something that both the magistrate and the chief would agree on and therefore the people bought into that ruling and that decision and I think it worked very well because it was respecting their traditional system. Actually, what broke down their, their system was democracy. Democracy has never really worked in Africa. <laughs> I, know, I know you guys worship at the altar of democracy, but I actually don't think democracy works here at all. I think that traditional system. And you know, I, before the coronavirus, uh, uh, last year in January, February, I was in Bali. And I was really amazed because in Indonesia, they have almost the same system. Every neighborhood uh, um, 
uh, have a thing called a banjar. And the banjars are usually religious guys, but you must bear in mind Bali is not primarily Muslim, it's primarily uh, uh, Hindu. And so the banjars are, are but nevertheless, the banjars are not, not even necessarily elders. They might be guys your age, but they guys everyone respects as, as uh, squeaky clean um, and kind, intelligent, uh, committed youngsters. And they all wear traditional clothes with like a, a traditional turban and beautiful clothes. And you can often see them um, sitting under a shady tree having prayers and that type of thing. <clears throat> and they are called the Banjar and they control their neighborhood. And the police may not come into their neighborhood and arrest anybody without the Banjar's permission. So in Bali, the most powerful people are the Banjar who are respected by the local community and in fact elected by the local community. And and then the Banjars get together and they, you know, elect provincial leaders and the provincial leaders get together and they elect the prime minister kind of thing. So it's it doesn't have that kind of Western politics thing, which is from the top down. It's actually from the bottom up. So when I had my bag stolen in Bali with my cell phone and everything, I went to the police and they weren't interested. They said, go to the tourist police. So I went to the tourist police. They weren't interested either. But they said, look, we'll draw up a report for you so you can use it when you claim with your insurance company. But don't expect anybody to actually find the thief or anything. And then the local Bali people said, why, why didn't you go to the Banjar in that area? Because this guy said, I had my phone stolen in the, in the Banjar. And I reported it to the local Banjar. And they said, was it a... A red scooter and the guy yeah it was a guy on a red scooter he grabbed my bag they said okay leave it with us honestly wasn't an hour or two later he got a he got a call at his hotel the the banjo said come and collect your phone you know because they knew it was this this youngster and and so this guy said so did you catch the guy and they said yeah don't you worry about that we it's our problem we'll we'll sort him out we know exactly who took your phone he has your phone Let's just leave it at that, you know, but and they sort it out probably, you know, I don't know, spoke to the youngsters' parents or what, you know, it was just a system that really worked and it was very similar to Zimbabwe. So if you ask me what mistakes we made and what mistakes any military makes when they go into a foreign country is you impose your value system, you impose your paradigm, your mindset on the local populace and you try and westernize them. So you go to Hawaii where all the women are walking around topless in grass skirts and you make them dress up like Victorian uh, missionaries, you know, and, and it's hot in Hawaii. It, Victorian clothing doesn't work <laughs> so well, you know. I don't know. It just seems like we always mess up like that. We try and change them into how we are instead of respecting their local traditions and culture. And that's, yeah, that's my biggest advice is if you're a foreign army, they are going to resent you if you come and impose your culture on them. Doesn't matter who, they're going to resent you if you come and impose your culture on them and, and disrespect their culture. Uh, and it's the same in Asia as it is in Africa, etc. It's uh, and, and in Middle East, it's the same. It's not yeah. my work. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that's a really great point you've made, multiple points you've made. Uh, I mean, you can just imagine the other way around, right? If someone were to come to the United States or go to Great Britain and try to impose their thought process on them, on you know Americans, on Brits, I'm sure it wouldn't go down the same way either. <laughs> so it, it really does. It's, you know, you have to learn from that. Think of it like that. That's, that's fantastic. Um, just before I let you go here, I, I wanted to know, uh, in your experience uh, in the Bush War, when maybe you had some downtime or anything like that, did you have any uh, humorous incidents that you might remember or recall, just so we could end on a high note here? <laughs> uh, I have a couple of humorous stories at my own expense. Um, uh, I think every soldier's uh, nightmare is to have an accidental discharge. Uh, or a negligent discharge. I don't know what you call it in your army, but it's in our army. It was instantly punishable by 28 days in detention barracks, which is basically military jail, where where they they you you run around until you drop with exhaustion every day, and you get all your hair shaved off and everything. 
anyway, being a machine gunner, I didn't want to carry my machine gun on guard duty. And I was woken up in the middle of the night. And this guy offered to lend me his FAL, FN. And I went through the process of clearing the thing. But I must have got the order mixed up. Because instead of removing the magazine and working the thing, I think I worked the thing and then removed the magazine and then put the magazine back. Anyway, when I fired it, yes, I was pointing it up into the sky. <coughs> it was this loud bang and this lone tracer bullet rose up into the sky. And I knew immediately I'd woken up the whole uh, army base, basically. I was right next to the Seleucid's fort. And I thought very quickly, I, I knew instantly I, I was in deep trouble. And so I shouted at the top of my voice, Halt! Who goes there? You know? <laughs> and I made out like I was shouting at some guy who was running away from me. Anyway, uh, my story was, um, you know, who was it who said, um, what a tangled web we weave when at first we practice to deceive, you know? But anyway, my story was that there was a some guy checking out our camp and I shouted at him to stop and or I asked him who he was and then he ran away and I fired a warning shot over his head. That was my story. So eight o'clock the next morning, I get marched into Major Doug Lambert's uh, office at, in, the, in the ops room. And he, uh, he looks at me and he says, so Van, I believe you had a, an accidental discharge last night. So I said, no, sir, there was this guy checking out our camp and I told him my whole lie. And, and he says, well, you know, we've got the Salute Scouts Fort here and so these guys are some of the best trackers in the world. And they did a 360 last night and they found absolutely no tracks at all. And so there's this, this long silence, you know. And then he says, with a twinkle in his eye, he looked at me and said, next time be more careful, Van, dismissed. <laughs> and I, I walked out of there and I was... Like, sure, I got off so lightly, yeah. Oh, dear. Um, uh, but ac accidental discharges is a, is, a, is a topic that, you know, around the campfire will bring lots of stories. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. Uh, the, other, the, the other one, uh, I was on duty at 5 o'clock in the morning on guard duty. And it was my job to start the fire for the donkey boilers to warm up the water for the guys to have a shower. And in those days, Fire Force, our, our jock, our Joint Operations Center was right next to a, a, down the hill, there was a football field with all of our helicopters parked on this football field. And we didn't have a lot of helicopters. We had maybe a dozen of them and most of them were parked on this field. And next to each helicopter, which was a stupid, they changed this shortly after that, was a huge pile of drums of fuel, okay, aviation fuel. So <clears throat> because I was lazy, uh, we all used to do it. I chucked a whole lot of wood on the on the fire and then I got a bucket and I went down into the field of the choppers and I tilted over one of these big drums and I took half a bucket of aviation fuel, carried it up the hill and threw it on the fire. And this huge cloud of steam <coughs> rose up and I was fascinated because it, was, it wasn't steam, it was <laughs> vaporized fuel. And it, but it was heavy and it went it went like a big snake going down the hill, down into the drain, spreading out like fingers onto the field. And when it was about this far from a pile of drums, I threw a match and the whole thing just blew up. <laughs> but I, I, it stopped just short of this pile of drums. If those drums had gone up, I would have wiped out the whole of Seven Squadron in one go. And I would have got a medal from Robert Mugabe, you know, for doing the most damage to the Rhodesian Air Force. But uh, as it turned out, nobody knew about it except me. And uh, but how, they'll never know how close I came to destroying our air superiority in one go. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Those are great. Those are great. And it, it's so great to have you on. I mean, I feel like we could talk for hours. Um, yeah. But, you know, I really appreciate you coming on the show. Thank you so much. Pleasure, my friend. Thanks for having me. Thank you.